Bibles with me into the book of Genesis at chapter number 3. <coughs> Genesis at chapter 3. Verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk a minute about the song of the seed. The song of the seed. Here in seed form is the gospel of salvation through the grace of God. Here we can see the first stitch in the scarlet thread of redemption that courses its way through the entire word of God. Amen. The Latin phrase proto-evangelium, the first gospel message, is preached at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, he writes for us the creation story of how God created every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, every living thing God created, and then he created after its own kind. And then God created man in his own image and in his own likeness and breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living soul. And God gave man Adama the privilege of naming every living thing. But Adam did not have a suitable mate. He did not have a suitable counterpart. So God caused the deep sleep to come upon Adam and took from his side a rib and created woman. So Adam and Eve lived together in the garden of Eden that God had planted for them in perfect union, in complete harmony one with another. They were ignorant but happy. Ignorant not in terms of foolish but ignorance in terms of completion and having their completion in God. They needed no information. God took care of them. He fed them. He provided for them. Everything they needed, God provided. So they were in perfect ignorance because God had given them a prohibition. He said to the man, of every tree in the garden, you shall freely eat. Except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Satan comes in the form of a serpent and speaks to the one who has not been given the prohibition. He speaks to Eve, the weaker of the two. She has not been given any instruction. God has given Adam instruction. And Eve saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eyes, it was good to eat, and it was desirous to make one wise. 
and she willingly ate. Nothing happened because Eve was not given any instruction. Her husband Adam comes along and he willingly eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all of a sudden chaos ensues. Everything that was in order is now in disorder for God now reverses everything he had put in place. And he comes looking for them walking in the garden in the cool of the day as was their usual fellowship. But this day when God comes looking for them, they are hiding. God says, Adam, where are you? Uh, not because God does not know where Adam is. Because there's nothing God cannot know. Adam, where are you? Not in terms of your geographical location. But Adam, where are you in terms of our spiritual fellowship? Because the last time I met you, we talked face to face. But now you're hiding from me. And Adam says, I'm hiding because I'm naked. God said, who told you that you were naked? Adam starts shifting the blame. The woman you gave me. And then the woman blames the serpent. And then God meets out judgment on Adam and Eve because of their sin. But in the midst of that tragic judgment, God sounds the music of hope. God gives them the song of the sea. Uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Talking to Satan now. Uh, the, the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. And the serpent shall bruise his heel. In this song, there is the personality of the promised lamb. The personality of this lamb is that he is unique in his origin. I want you to get that. The seed of the woman. That's unique. That's, that's, that's Bible talk. Uh, that's, that's Holy Spirit speech. Uh, the seed of the woman. I, I want to beat that into you this morning. The seed of the woman. The, the seed of the woman. The woman doesn't have a seed. The seed comes from the male of the species. The seed is planted in every male of the species. Because the woman can only produce after being impregnated by the seed. The seed comes from the man. But right here the scripture says the seed not of the man but of the woman. That's foretelling Isaiah's virgin birth. That's pre-announcing Gabriel's announcement that a, a virgin shall bring forth a son. That, that's Bible talk because virgins don't bear children. The seed cannot come from the woman because she has a womb that receives the seed. I still don't think I got that over to you. Uh, the woman is a receiver. I said the woman is a receiver. The woman is a receiver. The woman is a receiver. You know where I'm trying to go with it. I don't need to go there, do I? All right, I will. The woman and the man fit perfectly together because one of them gives the seed 
and the other receives the seed and anything other than that is ungodly. Somebody ought to help me preach it. But, but right here in the text, the seed of the woman. Which means Christ could not have been born of the seed of a man. Because inherent in the seed of the man is the sin nature. I wish I had a Bible reading. And since Christ is incapable of sinning, Joseph could not be his father. The Holy Ghost came upon Mary and she was pregnant not from Joseph because they were engaged. But the Holy Ghost overshadowed her and placed in her a perfect, sinless See that came from God Himself. What is born of Mary is of the Holy Ghost. It is God in human flesh. I wish I had help to preach right here. That that's unique. That that the Creator of the ends of the earth would become an embryo. That God himself would lower himself, reduce himself to become the seed in a teenage girl's womb. That's, that's called kenosis. Uh, Self-emptying. God poured himself out. He lowered himself because we couldn't come up to where he was. So he came down to where we are. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. So he came to pay a debt he didn't owe. Yeah. He's unique in his origin. The seed of the woman. But in that personality, he's unique in his occupation. The lamb was coming not to show us a better way. He was coming not to improve our environment. He was coming not to improve our social standing. He was coming to defeat evil in the flesh. Jesus is not someone you add to your life. Jesus is not some additive or some commodity that you attach on to your life to get better. Jesus has to become your whole life. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Uh, Jesus is not a part of the truth. Uh, like these new age philosophers try to tell us that truth comes from Buddhism and, and truth comes from Shintoism and Taoism and, and impersonal idealism and evolutionary. That's nonsense. Truth can only come from God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, since the Lord led me to that, you remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate? Pilate asked him, what is truth? Now Pilate was not interested in an answer. He was just intrigued by the question. And many people who come to church are not interested in the answer. They're just intrigued by the question. Because they stay far away from what the Lord is doing as if they're going to get infected by some bug of some kind. But the Holy Spirit does not come to catch you. You come to get more of him. I wish I had one or two witnesses here. You, you can't catch the Holy Spirit. He has to grab and arrest you or else you'll never be fit for kingdom service because he came not 
to do renovations, but to tear you down altogether. You don't need a renovation. You need to be torn down from the top to the bottom. And the reason perhaps why you will never get saved is you think that's some part of you that's pretty good. And you don't need to change that part of you. But the Bible says there's none good. No, not one. Our righteousness, Isaiah says, is as filthy rags. And no, no matter how dressed up you are this morning, you're not even worthy to call on his name. But his mercy, his grace is sufficient. Have I got a witness here? All that I have, all that I am, all that I will ever be is wrapped up in the fact that Jesus came to defeat evil on my behalf. The church is not a place for rehab. The church is the place to, get come, to come and get torn down altogether. See, a whole lot of folk don't want to come to this church and to this kind of preaching because the gospel has to ransack your life. Let me, let me see if I can make that make sense. When thieves break in your house, if you left your valuables on the table, they wouldn't have to search through all the drawers. They wouldn't have to tear up anything if you left your valuables right there on the table. That's why they ransack the place because they're looking for something of value. You're going to help me preach right here. When the Spirit of God comes to save us, the valuables are not just laying around on the table. He got to tear something up. He got to tear up your pride. He got to tear up your self-importance. He's got to tear up your arrogance. He's got to tear up your ugly ways. He's got to tear you up because the valuables inside got to come out. Because naturally, I'm no good. See, I said I just got by you. I, I, I need about 10 or 15 crooks in here who can help me testify that the Lord had to ransack. The Lord is still tearing up some stuff. The Lord is still pulling down some stuff. Because I've been saved going on 40 years and the Lord is still tearing up some stuff to make me in the image of Jesus Christ. He came unique in origin, unique in occupation. That's the personality of the lamb in the song. But now I want you to see the purpose of the lamb in the song. The scripture says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Jesus comes as a warrior king. Enmity. That word enmity brings up the notion of warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Warfare, spiritual warfare has to be, has to take place in order for Jesus to be our warrior king. Because without Christ, we are the enemy of God. Talk back to me if you can. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that this little weak, anemic picture of Jesus as some little 90 pound blue eyed weakling who comes to sprinkle fairy dust on everybody and make everybody feel good about themselves. Jesus didn't come to make us feel good about ourselves. Jesus did not come to sprinkle fairy dust on everybody and grant your every request. Jesus came saying you've got to separate from your mother and father. 
You got to separate from your brother and sister. Because if you love them more than you love me, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. He said, I've come to separate fathers from their sons. I wish I had a Bible reader. Mothers from their daughters. You got to seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness so that all these other things can be added unto you. You got to put your desires aside. You got to put your wishes away. You got to put your dreams on the back burner and say, I am thine, O oh Lord. I've heard your voice. And it told thy love to me. And I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. That's warfare. Sometimes God got to fight with me to make me who he wants me to be. I wish I had a witness here. Because most of the time, I want my way. I want to do what I want. And not only is Jesus fighting the devil, but Jesus got to fight me to help me. See how quiet you got right there? To those of you who think you're pretty good, I'm not talking to you. But I'm talking to some of us who are still stubborn. Some of us who know better, but we do it anyway. Some of us who read the Bible, but we still stumble and fall. That's spiritual warfare. Uh. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching about this, but I had not truly experienced it until I got sick. And, and, and the Spirit leads me to say to you now that you can't preach what you don't live. You can, you can get happy on somebody else's testimony but it doesn't really come close to you until you experience it for yourself I, I've been preaching over 30 years about spiritual warfare but I had not experienced it personally until I was in the hospital and Satan had just about convinced me that God had been unfaithful Satan said to me, I've been preaching, you've been preaching his word. You've been pastoring his people. If he loves you like you've been preaching, why you can't turn yourself over? You can't even feed yourself. What kind of God would leave you in this predicament? Somebody ought to help me here. And I struggled with that because when you are vulnerable, the devil comes to whisper in your ear, that God is not all he says he is. And I was so weak in my body and in my faith that I had a hard time praying. Stay with me now. My sister got into bed with me. And she said, I've been praying for you. And now I'm going to pray with you. She started praying like those old sisters used to pray here at Lily Grove. Uh, when we used to have Monday night prayer band after the fifth Sunday. I think we ought to go back to prayer band uh, on Monday night after the fifth Sunday because those old women would get on their knees and say, Lord, here I am. Knee bent. I wish I had a witness here. And body already by. My sister started asking the Lord to have mercy on me. And she said, now you need to start praying for yourself. And all of a sudden, when I couldn't pray just days ago, I start remembering how to give God praise. I will bless the Lord. That's, that's, that's what came in my mind. At all times, you are more than a conqueror. I'm persuaded that neither life nor death, angels or principalities, things present nor things to come, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. And my strength started to come back to me. I started to breathe 35 and 45 and 75% on my own because the Lord is a healer. The Lord is a provider. The Lord will show up just when you need him the most. 
to fight your battles in your time of spiritual warfare. Some parent, some parent ought to go home this morning and tell the devil you're a liar. You are not going to have my son to homosexuality. You are not going to turn my daughter out on drugs. Satan, you're a liar. You're not going to take over this house. I plead the blood of Jesus around the doorpost, around my television set, in my computer room, in the bedroom where I sleep, in the kitchen where I eat breakfast with my family. Have mercy on me, oh God, according to your love and kindness. And I dare you to do battle with this devil in the name of Jesus. Jesus will show up and fight your battle. Which leads me to this other purpose of the lamb in the song. He not only shows up as a warrior, but he shows up as a winner. It's right here in the text. And between thy seed and her seed, watch this, it shall bruise your head. Talking to the devil now. And you shall bruise his heel. The King James uses the word bruise twice. But the first bruise is not bruise like Satan is going to do to Jesus. It's not the same kind of bruising. What Satan will do to Jesus is temporary. But what Jesus will do to Satan is eternal. Somebody ought to help me here. He will bruise Jesus' heel, but Jesus will crush. There's a difference between a bruise and a crush. What happened on Friday to Jesus was a bruise. But what don't happen on Sunday morning to Satan was a crush. He died didn't he die? Yeah. But bright early yeah. Sunday morning, he got up from the grave to crush Satan's head. And so now, the only way you can be a winner is to be in the warfare. Somebody ought to help me here. If you want to win, you got to get in the fight. Now I want you to know something. It's a bruising battle. Sometimes folk who are supposed to love you will turn their backs on you. Sometimes people you thought would have been in your corner will get with other folk to run you down. Have I got a witness here? Some mornings you'll get up full of fire and the Holy Ghost and before 12 o'clock the very thing you said you would never do that's what you find yourself doing. Paul said the good that I would do. I need a Bible reader here. I find myself not doing. And the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man, not that I was, but that I still am. I need an advocate. I need my elder brother to come and stand alongside me to give me victory in my warfare. That's the personality of the lamb. That's the purpose of the lamb. But I want you to see finally in this song the portrait of the lamb. He came as a sacrifice. I wish I had some noise right here. Because in the Old Testament spiritual economy the priests and the high priests would continually day and night make sacrifices for the people and their sins there was a constant going and coming a shedding of blood because the sins needed to be constantly atoned for and then once a year 
on the day of atonement, the high priest himself would robe in his ceremonial ephod and put tassels, uh, put bells on his tassels and a rope around his waist to go behind the veil that separated the holy of holies from the most holy. And then he would bring some blood that he had sprinkled from a he goat. And then there was another goat that he had turned loose in the wilderness. And he had become for them a scapegoat. And then he would sprinkle that blood on the golden laver. On the mercy seat. And then he would plead the sins of the people. And then God would atone for their sins only once a year. But they had to keep on coming day in and day out because the sacrifice needed to be constantly atoned for because the people did not have their sins taken away their sins were only covered but one Friday on a skull shaped hill and on a blood soaked cross Jesus came not to cover my sins but to wash my sins away and when he died there was no more need for a high priest coming and going in the temple on the day of atonement when Jesus shed his blood the Bible says his spirit went into Hades and preached to those who were chained in darkness he said to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob Come on, all things are now ready. You're going to help me close this, won't you? He saved Rahab. He saved a Canaanite woman. He saved a Shulamite woman. He saved those whose faith had been reckoned to them as righteousness. Because he was the Lamb of God. I wish I had a witness. Slain from the foundation of the world. But let me tell you how the song ends. Let me give you a demonstration of how the song ends. It started with Abraham. Abraham was the father of the faithful. But he failed the Lord and said Sarah was his sister when she was really his wife. So the song ends on a bad note. It's in a minor key because Abraham was not the real sacrifice and then comes Jacob Jacob is the second note in the song but Jacob was not worthy because he tricked his brother out of his birthright he stole his brother's blessing you're gonna help me close this won't you and then he saw Esau coming and a ladder ascended from heaven and he saw angels going up and coming down and he said surely the Lord is in this place but Jacob was not the real sacrifice he was the song in a minor key and then Moses came born of Yoshebed and Amram but Moses killed an Egyptian shoulder you gonna help me close this won't you Moses was supposed to go in the promised land but he disobeyed God's command. Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. And Moses was not our real sacrifice. And then David came. David also was a man after God's own heart. But he was not the real sacrifice. Because although he killed Goliath, although he slayed his thousands, he took another man's wife to bed and had that same man killed and covered up his sin for a whole year but then Nathan the prophet goes to the palace of King David and says oh king you are the man and God had planned for you to build him a house but God will now build you a house through your son Solomon but Solomon was still a sour note he had 700 women on the side. He had 300 wives. And God couldn't use him because he fell in love with strange women.